Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher, and this is the show where I talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm excited to share with you a conversation I had with Eric Partaker. He's the author of the new book, The Three Alarms, a simple system to transform your health, wealth, and relationships forever. And the focus of this conversation is this idea of focus, of having a super simple system where you are able to focus in on the roles in your life at the time that you need to, that you can have a meaningful life without having to sacrifice your health to achieve success, without overworking, by being able to focus in on a few key areas that will help you change everything. And as Eric talks about in this conversation, it's as simple as setting an alarm. Not only that, but we talk about how you can gain 13 weeks back every year or an additional decade in your life. So I'll stop teasing and just say, enjoy this conversation with Eric Partaker. Well, this week, it is my privilege to welcome to the show, Eric Partaker. Eric, welcome to the show. Eric, so excited to be here, first and foremost, because you share an awesome name like me, Eric and Eric. I mean, come on, this is going to make this show be- you know, the best show ever already. Yes, yes. Well, and you have the C spelling, E-R-I-C, which is honestly more popular or more common. Everybody always writes my name wherever I go, whether it's a Starbucks or whatever. They misspell it. They put E-R-I-C. It's E-R-I-K. And I always have to say with a K and then... Then they add the K after the C. And I'm like, no, 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 no. C or K without the C. So, yeah. Well, yeah, it's <laughs> anyway. funny because it's funny because my my name originally was Eric with a K. I'm half Norwegian, half American. And um, at at one point, my mother decided to, um, you know, more Americanize my name. And when I was 11 years old, um, she changed it from uh, Eric with a K to Eric with a C. Oh, how confusing <laughs> to to have gotten through childhood locking it in and then have it changed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel your pain. Uh, I guess we have a mutual pain for different reasons when it comes to this name. I'm yeah. I'm part Scandinavian. That's where mine is uh, coming from as well. So yeah. Well, are you, what, are you, are you Nor- Norwegian or uh, it's Swedish? My mom Swedish. on my okay. mom's side. Yes. So yeah. Nice. Okay. All right. It's, yeah. Like I said, it's going to be a great episode. It All is. Right. <laughs> it is. So man, we got introduced through a mutual uh, friend, Jeff Goins. He's awesome. Been on the show a number of times. And I honestly, I should have known that he helped you with the writing of your book and I, I loved it. And I, like all things, you know, the lessons come after a story. And you you have a particular story of your life or a specific incident, I should say, that that Mm -hmm. kind of becomes the catalyst for your change in perspective, your change in thinking. And I'd love for you to share that story here as it will catalyze this conversation. Yeah, no problem at all. Yeah. So um, so this is actually how I open up uh, my new book, The Three Alarms. And. Um, it starts off. Uh, we go back in time. It's ten years ago, little little over than little over ten years ago, and and I've just boarded a plane return flight to London, and um, and shortly after the cabin doors close, I could sense something's not right. And uh, as the plane begins to ascend, I have a lot of pressure that develops, you know, in my chest. Uh, soon that that pressure becomes pain, goes through my left shoulder, down my left arm. And I start um, sweating, uh, getting very, very nauseous. I said to my friend Lewis, uh, sat next to me, um, Lewis, can you can you feel my my arm, please? Um, you know, my left arm. And he feels my left arm, looks at me, and says, "Gosh, it feels like your arm's been hanging in a meat locker." And I said, "Yeah, that's that's how it feels for me too. And several degrees cooler than the rest of my body." And um, uh, Lewis jumps over, runs to get the attention of a flight attendant who then asked if there's a doctor on board, doctor uh, rushes up from the back of the plane. I was lucky there was a doctor on board, rushes up from the back of the plane, takes my vital signs and says, um, we need to land the plane immediately. I think he's having a heart attack. And, you know, when you hear those words, 35,000 feet in the air, um, let me just say, you feel as about as lonely as you will ever feel in your life. Um, you're you're as, as far away from help as you, know, you could possibly imagine. And, um, and as you can imagine, the descent felt like an absolute eternity. 
Um, I, I remember feeling just terrified that my heart would stop before reaching safety. And we finally did touch down in a small town in France. There was an ambulance waiting on the runway. Um, they took me into the, the waiting ambulance. They administered nitrates to open up basically, you know, the, the, the nitroglycerin, which opens up, uh, relaxes your, your, your blood vessels. And, um, uh, the purpose of that is to increase the blood flow to the heart. And, uh, and the ambulance sped off to the local hospital. And I looked up into the eyes of the paramedic looking down at me and I said, please don't let me die. I have a five year old son. And, you know, he said something along the lines of just, just, you know, relax, rest up. You know, I, you know, I think we got you just in time. And, um, yeah, that was a pivotal, you know, moment for me. I had been absolutely obsessed with uh, reaching my full potential with peak performance with um you know becoming all that I was capable of being uh for the 10 years prior to that and and I was working really really hard you know I was working 100 hour work weeks at McKinsey and Company um helping build Skype before we sold it to eBay for for about 4 billion dollars in 2004 or 5 whenever it was um and then with you know a few of my own businesses and and it was just this constant you know hamster wheel of achievement and um as you can imagine when when I woke up the next day in the hospital I thought okay well this isn't working you know this needs to change that was pretty damn close and that was the catalyst you know the 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 catalyst moment that that made that 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 kicked off a search process which I've you know, since dedicated my life to, to figure out how do we achieve our full potential? How do we join the 2% club? Abraham Maslow estimated only 2% of people realize their full potential. How do we, you know, how do we achieve our full potential, but without, you know, breaking down or without sacrificing the things in life that matter most to us? One, glad that you, you know, survived and went through the, I mean, went through the process is one thing, but like that you came out the other end and that you had that perspective shift, that realization, or at least I should say you, that you had the beginning of the perspective shift, because I'm sure it wasn't just a suddenly you were enlightened because you survived that plane and getting, you know, getting landed and the nitrates and everything. No, it wasn't, it wasn't immediate at all. And, um, you know, so I almost lost my life there, but it, it still, it still wasn't enough. <laughs> right. And, and, um, and I started to prioritize my health and I was trying to work less, but I wasn't getting all the pieces of the puzzle together, uh, quite right, you know, just yet. And, um, and then a few years later, you know, my mo- one morning, my wife with tears in her eyes said that she was leaving me. And, um, uh, if I didn't change my ways, you know, if I, she said I was present, but I wasn't really I was there. Sorry, I was there, but I wasn't really, you know, present. I wasn't like really available. And, um, and that was a, another wake up call. So, you know, first it was like almost losing my life. Then it was like almost losing my marriage. And, and I thought to myself, okay, well, there's no way I can let this happen. And, um, and that was, you know, kind of the last piece of the puzzle. And that's when I really started to zero in on. So, so I, the the book is called the three alarms because what I simply did was I I grabbed my phone and I said, okay, you know, enough's enough. Who, who am I at my best across three dimensions? This, this for me, these three dimensions are the, to me, this is the 80, 20 of life improvement, the 20% of things you could focus on for 80% of the improvement that you seek. Mm -hmm. And so I, I focused on, okay, I needed to find a best self identity on the health front. I needed to find a best self identity on the work front. And I need to define a best self identity on the home front or, you know, set another, in other words, you know, health, wealth, and relationships, which, uh, coincidentally end up being the three most searched, you know, categories on the internet. And, you know, rightfully so it's, what are we without our uh, health? Um, our work, you know, our, our wealth creation, uh, gives us the things that we, you know, um, uh, many of the things we want in life and, um, and our relationships are the things most important to us. You know, when I was in the, in that ambulance, I didn't say, please don't let me die. I have to clear out my inbox. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's like, please, please don't let me die. You know, I have a five-year-old son. Right. So, so I thought, okay, if I could choose me at my best and give it a name on each of those three fronts, 
and then time time it as a cue to remind me of that identity at the right time of day, you know, the time of day that would most benefit be, from being powered by that best self identity. I was like, let, 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 let me give that a shot. And, and, um, I've actually, you know, I've, I've since, even, even since I wrote the book, and this is what makes it so fun and exciting that you can make it quite dynamic. Uh, you know, I've changed these identities a bit. So at, at 6 30 AM, the first alarm goes off for me and it says pro athlete, because that's the version of me that's going to go to the gym in the morning. Do I always want to go to the gym? No. Um, does a pro athlete go to the gym, whether they feel like it or not? Yes. Does a pro athlete, when they're in the gym, complete the workout, even if they feel too tired? Yes. So I rather have the pro athlete version of me go to the gym than me. And at 6.30 a.m., I cue that version of me. At 9 a.m., the next alarm goes off. It says Elon Musk these days. I've <laughs> taken it. I've taken a person. I, you know, he, he works all the time, but while I am working, I want to have that like fast focused, like genius nature of Elon. Right. So that's who I switch into. Um, at 9 a.m., it's almost like a, like I'm putting on Elon's head. That's kind of the way I look at it. And then at 6 30 p.m., um, it says world's best husband and father. That phrase goes off. To prompt the question, how would the world's best husband and father walk through that door right now? And the real secret here is that in the absence of this intentionality, we're kind of drifting through life and not achieving our best. The moment you define what does best look like in each of these three key areas, find a way of reminding yourself daily. It just automatically starts to close the gap between your current and best self in each of those domains. Yeah. A couple of... um key questions come to mind for me then when with the uh with the setting of these alarms obviously these three areas make a lot of sense and cover pretty much everything in terms of your you know your identity and and I love that you're putting it that you know you you don't want to just be good at work you want to be good at life and not just good you want to be great in other words i mean you you your aspirational and inspirational identities that you're choosing for each of these alarms aren't you know you're in other words you know you're a good looking guy i can see your picture here but on zoom while we're recording this and i've seen your picture in books and stuff and i wouldn't say you're not a pro athlete but i know that's that's not who you are per se but it but it is what your alarm is stating there with health and it's it's aspirational it's it's almost the healthy putting on of that identity as you become that identity. It's not, it's not as cheap as fake it till you make it. It's no, I am that thing and I'm getting better at it all the time. Totally. And again, we, 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 you have to have a target and sometimes people have said, well, yeah, but you know, you're, you're choosing to be something that you're not. And, and to me, that's just a little bit lazy though, because it's, um, uh, you're who, who deep down. And if I had a magic button and I could walk around to every person on the planet and say, Hey, if you press this button, you'll instantly become the best version of you in the areas of life that matter most who on the planet isn't going to press the button, right? It's like everyone will press that, they'll press that button. So many times they'll break their finger. Um, so it's like, everyone wants to become their best. And the point with choosing these identities is that you have no chance to become a better version of yourself if you're going to continue being the person that you've always been, right? You need to step it up. And then the beautiful thing is, is that if you really break down the word identity, identity simply comes from two Latin words. And I learned this from James Clear, two, two uh, Latin words, which in effect mean repeated beingness. So your identity is literally the summation of the things that you repeatedly do. So although at first you might choose something that's super aspirational that you feel is quite distant from your current behavior and doesn't really feel like you, if you're just choosing it as a prompt to start acting and encouraging yourself to be like that, the more you actually act and behave that way, the more you will become it. The gap will close. You won't feel like you're putting on, say, a Halloween costume, you'll just become that. We only are the things that we do at the end of the day. So why not find a way to prompt yourself to do more of the things that would be consistent of you at your best than anything less? 
It's funny that we were talking about this because the first book or first ebook or whatever, it, it was a short book that uh, Jeff Goins came out with and I talked to him about so long ago, almost a decade ago now, uh, was you are a writer, so start acting like one. And and so in a sense, because you are doing the thing, then you are that thing. And so it's, you know, I said earlier, oh, well, Eric, you're not a pro athlete, but you know what? You are. Because one, you're stating that you are, and then you're doing the things that a pro athlete would do. So the only missing thing would be if you were like competing professionally, which, you know, who, who knows who cares, but like you could if you wanted to, in other words. And so it, it, and, and as James Clear is talking about, you know, identity, the repeated, uh, what, how did he phrase it again? It was repeatedly he, doing it. Uh, re- identity comes from two Latin words, which mean repeated beingness. Beingness. Yeah. And that if I am a thing, then people think, well, if I am the thing, if I'm or- if I- if I'm already being that thing, then I don't have to consciously keep repeating being that thing. You just, in, in other words, they think it's a it's a one time like I reached the peak of the mountain when in fact it's a consistent like repeated showing up in other words and that's what you're doing with the alarms the alarms are just like training wheels on the bike you know you get yeah. to a point where maybe you're not you know reliant upon them but you need something to you need a way to constantly present to yourself at the appropriate time of day hey This is what you said best looks like. And then that is a prompt to make you think more intentionally. Okay. If I was going to act in accordance with that version of me, how will I show up now in the period of time ahead? Or sometimes, you know, it's not having you think through intentionally, you know, it may go off at at a time when you're acting inconsistent with that. And it just, just prompts some counsel. It's like, okay, well, what should I be doing to, um, you know, to change my behavior? And none of this is, we all know how to do this. You know, I'm sitting right now looking at a post-it note um, attached to my monitor with a drawing of Captain America from my seven-year-old son, Leo. I bought him, you know, Captain America shield a couple of weeks ago. And when that shield arrived, I didn't have to then sit down with Leo and say, okay, and now I want to you know, do some behavioral training on how to you know, <laughs> uh, be like Captain America. Um, you know, none of that was needed. I handed him the shield. He immediately ran, got the ca- Captain America costume that he had. He put on the whole thing and boom, he was like jumping around, like, you know, going crazy. Uh, he was Captain America. So we, we all know how to do this. We all know how to choose an identity and just start acting in accordance with it. And it's something that we knew from childhood and it's something that we were super proficient at doing. And it's nothing more than societal conditioning, which has kind of layered and layered on top of that and kind of repressed that ability. And what's fun is that this simple little technique allows you to kind of unearth what you did in the past. So my point is, is that I'm not trying to get anybody listening to do anything that you haven't already done very successfully before. And it sounds like there's probably a potential tendency to maybe overthink this in terms of, no, I have to figure out what the exact right name for the alarm to be is. And then I also have to think of when the most perfect time to have it go off that day would be. But I think it's probably pretty intuitive. Yeah. And you, and you should just get going with it because it's completely dynamic. You can change it. You can, once you get those alarms set up, you can adjust the times easily. You can go back in and change the name or the label uh, of the alarm super easily. The point, just get started. Just take the, if you're listening to this right now, don't, you know, don't let, don't let this be one of those things where it's like, Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, that, <laughs> that's not going to get you anywhere. Like translate the knowledge into action. Take, you know, pause the episode, you know, just pause it right now. Yeah. You know, grab your phone and literally create three alarms. Choose what is, you know, what, what is you at your best? If you're into swimming, maybe you're Michael Phelps or maybe you're into tennis and you're, you know, one of the Williams sisters, but just choose, choose a name for you at your best in the health front. Choose a time, put it in your phone. 
right now. Choose a name for you at your best on the wealth front or the work front, whether it's a person or, you know, you call yourself world's best CEO or an inspiring leader or whatever it is. Choose it. Put it at the right time. 9 a.m., 8.30 a.m., whenever your day starts. And do the same for that transition moment from work to home. Who 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 are you at your best? You know, sometimes uh, I, I've had my six thirty p.m. alarm. Sometimes it says um, Mr. Rogers <laughs> because <laughs> I saw I saw a beautiful day in the neighborhood. You know, amazing right. film. And I thought, yeah, and I thought, man, if I was like him, um, speak of the devil. So right now, can you hear that? That's great. That is my alarm going off right right now because it's 6.30 p.m. for me. Um, and it just said Mr. Rogers, which is what I have it at currently. And that's great because it's reminding me, you know, when we wrap up and I walk out of my office here and I go downstairs, it's like, okay, well, you know, let's have fun with this. If I was like Mr. Rogers going to greet my family, um, how how would I be doing it? Right. How would I behave? Yeah. Love it. And I love that. I love that um, you can say just those two words or that title, Mr. Rogers. And so many of us already know without having to really name it out loud and we don't have to. We can name in our brain. There's just this persona. There's this identity. There's this that that we, the identity that we saw him repeatedly being that of his gentleness, of his care, of his, and I, I'm not going to rattle them all off, but just already in my head, there's this feeling, there's a feeling, there's an essence to him, if you will. And so you already know, like all, already me just hearing you say it, like puts me in a warm, fuzzy place in a, in a really positive way to know like, oh yeah, no, I know exactly how to be with that, be like that right now if I had to think about it and, and aim for it. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's the whole point is like all of this stuff is, um, they're like uh, keyboard shortcuts. <laughs> yes, yes, that's great. That's a great, great analogy. I love this because it's it, again, it's a it's a moment of. I mean, it, you you do need to take a little bit of time, like you said. We if you haven't already paused this, and 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 if you did, and you're now hitting this spot, welcome back. Uh, glad you set those set those alarms. But it's a return to intentionality instead of just coasting, and it's and it's uh, intentionally placing recalibration moments into your day. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, and it all, you know, all great change starts with identity and that's, that's where you can create the big shifts. And, you know, in, in, in my book, the three alarms, I, I start there and I talk about identity, but I actually present in the book a framework for helping you once again, get into that 2% club, you know, the estimated 2% of people who are operating at their full potential. I present three levers and the acronym is IPA. So like the beer, but better for you. <laughs> and um, the I is for identity. So we've talked about that. And then I talk about productivity. And that's because, and, and then the A is anti-fragility. So the opposite of being fragile, mm -hmm. anti-fragile. So identity, productivity, anti-fragility. And the reason for, the reason that it's those three things. So we got, you know, identity, productivity, and anti-fragility across your health, wealth, and relationships. So it's like a matrix. And the reason I have those three things is because when we think about improving, we can get lost in a sea of so many different things to improve. But, you know, identity wise, we have to just choose what, again, what, uh, once again, what does best look like and then define it across the health front, the wealth front, the relationship front, because you can't become a better version of yourself if you're, again, can, can you continue being the person you've already, already been. But the problem is you can do that and then just sit on the sofa. You need to optimize yourself for action. And that's the productivity piece. You know, when I was growing up, um, uh, everyone said knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. That is so not the case these days. Knowledge is cheap. And, you know, the people who get ahead, the people who are, you know, doing great things, the people who are having an impact, um, you know, creating benefit, not just for themselves, but for others as well, are people who they're, they're people of action. They are highly productive and they get the right things done in the least amount of time. And and that's that's why I talk about the productivity piece. And, um, you know, one, one, just to expand on it too. Um, and this is something I talk about in the book as well. So the average person, uh, loses 28% of their, 
of their workday uh, by just jumping around from one thing to the next and never sticking with one thing long enough. And they do this at an insane rate. So up to 37 times an hour uh, jumping around, whether it's, you know, checking your phone or a little peek in the inbox here or now all of that creates a 28% loss in the day in terms of uh, I have to retrace my steps. Where was I? I've lost my momentum. So inefficiency. Now, if you take that 28% loss in the day, and I got this, by the way, this stat appeared in the book, The One Thing. So I took that stat and I said, okay, 28% loss in the day. If we apply that to all the working weeks in a year, that means that the average person is losing 13 weeks a year. The average person, therefore, is losing an entire calendar quarter wow. every yeah. year. And that's crazy, right? Because if we extrapolate that across a career, a 40-year career, the average person loses a decade. So my question you know, to the listeners is, if you're sitting there thinking, oh, you know, I'm overwhelmed, I'm, I'm, I'm not productive, I need more time. Well, yes. And do you think you'd be feeling that way if you had an extra quarter every year or if you had an extra decade in your lifetime? Um, and we can gain that by mastering the art of single tasking, by getting our phones out of sight, closing down all those browser tabs and just committing to working without distraction and interruption on one thing at a time until it's done, you know, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, whatever it's going to take. And if you do that, you'll add an entire quarter to your life every year. That's insane. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and, and a lot of people out there, I don't know. Have you ever heard of the, um, the 12 week year? No. Yeah. So the, the 12 week year is essentially, um, it's, it's, it's by looking at each quarter as if it was individually like a whole year and trying to move the needle each quarter. And, uh, I know like I've talked about it with uh, a friend of mine, Jeff, on this show before to suddenly have one more than actually 13 weeks is more than a quarter. So to have a, a little more than a quarter of a year each year on top of the regular year, I mean, that's huge. It's a huge amount of time to suddenly get back. And it's all by focusing. A hundred percent. It's all, it's all about, you know, just limiting your attention to that one thing in the moment, which requires it most rather than smashing it with a sledgehammer and, you know, diverting it across a multitude of things. And then the, the last piece that I talk about is anti-fragility. And this is, um, this is inspired by Nassim Taleb's book, Anti-Fragile. And there are things that actually benefit from chaos. You know, there's things that benefit from stress, many things. And, you know, our body is a perfect example. So if we stress a muscle, it causes it to grow. We expose the body to germs and bacteria. It builds the immune system. So, you know, stress builds strength is the point. And rather than stressing ourselves out by trying to pursue a stress-free life, the real secret is, why don't we embrace stress, step into it, turn life into one big mental training camp whereby every challenge, adversity, thing that doesn't go your way, these are nothing more than a personal trainer within your life presenting to you a dumbbell, a weight, asking you to, hey, curl this. Because if you do, you become stronger. But what happens if you just run away and walk out of the gym? You don't become stronger. You atrophy. You become weaker over time. This I also attach to a particular mindset, um, professional versus an amateur mindset. And this is uh, inspired by some um, uh, some thinking from Stephen Pressfield. I like to think, you know, so a professional knows that action generates feeling, whereas a amateur feels that or believes that feeling generates action. So the problem with amateur thinking is that you have to wait around your whole life feeling like doing things in order to get them done. That's pretty risky living in my book. Whereas a professional, even if they don't feel like it, they'll say to themselves, yeah, but what does that have to do with it? Action generates feeling, not feeling generating action. And so in an anti-fragile way, you know, they just step into it, even if it's uncomfortable, even if they don't want to do it, knowing that if they just get going, you know, they'll build some momentum and very likely start to feel like doing whatever it is that it is, you know? 
Well, this ties back into what we were talking about earlier with identity is that if you take each moment of stress that comes at you as one of those moments, as almost its own alarm to step into, you Mm -hmm. know, uh, when, when this, when these kinds of stressful moments come up, you know, there's not an audible (laughs) alarm like we heard earlier, but it can be a, a mental alarm, um, or a, a alarm of awareness to say when this comes up, or this kind of a situation comes up or whatever, who am I going to be in those moments? Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, to make a decision to turn pro, um, don't require yourself to have to feel like doing things, you know, benefit from the knowledge that by taking action, you'll generate the feelings that you require. And um, don't, you know, don't, um, uh, don't require a stress-free life. Realize the same thing that your body already gets that actually stress builds strength. So get what your body's already doing physically up in your head mentally. And how do you do that? Well, by changing your perception of things and just by practicing. Yeah. And I, by the way, I love Stephen Pressfield and I love, um, his, you know, reference of the, you know, the resistance as well as turning pro. Um, it's, it's, I've, I'm glad that you've adopted that here into this kind of, uh, threefold identity and or change and, and especially productivity path that you've carved out here. And I, I think this is going to do a lot of people uh, a lot of good to it may seem simple on the surface. And, and in fact, it is. But, you know, like most things co- that that people say, you know, common sense, it's common sense. My my father used to say common sense isn't very common. <laughs> and so yeah. You, yeah. We, we need to be reminded. Exactly. Exactly. Co- common sense is is not always common practice, right? Yes. Actually, yeah. probably a better way to put it right there is we may know things, but we don't act on them. And then by not acting on them, we start to forget them altogether. So uh, I I want to start pointing people to the book. However, I think this is going to be uh, like like it was for me, a moment of clarity and a moment of starting to recalibrate and and step into a, a new wave of intentionality towards uh repeated being in a in a higher um in in a state of extraordinariness i guess is the best way to put it so uh eric i know you've been doing some different kind of giveaways of the book and pointing people to different places to to learn more and and dive in um i'd love for you to maybe share where and when people could do that yeah, absolutely. So it's good timing if you're listening because it just happens to be coinciding with, um, you know, the book being relatively new and, 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 and launched for me. So I'm, uh, you know, spreading it out. The more the merrier that I have it. That's kind of the mode that I'm in. So it's already achieved, uh, bestseller status on Amazon. But if you'd like to get a free digital copy of the book, um, I'm offering that to all the listeners. Just head over to my website at Eric Partaker. So Eric with a C, as we said in the beginning, E-R-I-C, <laughs> um, Partaker, just like it sounds, P-A-R-T-A-K-E-R, ericpartaker.com. And um, uh, you'll see a, um, a little prompt uh, there that will let you sign up for the book, The Three Alarms. And you'll yeah get the digital copy delivered to your inbox and, you know, happy days. Awesome. Well, I hope that everybody partakes of your offer. I had to do that. I, sorry, I had to do that because we're talking about names so much. But uh, yeah, I, and and by the way, there's definitely a lot over there to check out. So I would do that because I did myself, by the way. Um, Eric, it's been awesome talking with you. And uh, we'll definitely, you know, the, the path that you're headed on next time you have a book, like we'll have to come back and, and talk more. Oh, totally. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely, um, really, really enjoyed the conversation, uh, big time. So I'll, um, uh, I do have two more actually, um, in the works and I'll, I'll be coming back. Great. Well, that's another podcast crossed off your podcast listening to do list. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Eric Partaker and started to consider what kind of alarms you're going to set when you're going to set them, what you're going to name them, and how you can start to participate in focus. For more conversation on that, make sure to check out my episodes I've done with Cal Newport specifically. Go to beyondthetodolist.com 
Not only that, but next week, Cal is coming back to the show to talk about a world without email. You heard that right. It's going to be a fun one. If you enjoyed this conversation, would you do me the favor of sharing it? Hit that share button in your podcast player app of choice. And thank you so much for sharing. Thank you again for listening. And I'll see you next episode.